This is a camera. This is a camera. And this is also a camera. In fact, the very first camera. Cameras come in all shapes and sizes, and their design, function, and required capabilities depend on their application. They range from the cameras we keep in our pockets, to the closed circuit surveillance cameras on our streets, and even the ones we send into outer space. This video will be focusing on the types of cameras used in television productions, looking at how and why they've been designed in a certain way, how they operate, and the part they play in the overall production workflow. So what makes a television camera different from any other kind of consumer or professional camera? Well, the difference becomes a lot clearer when you understand the nature of television productions, although cameras used for television differ greatly just among themselves. Which equipment is used and how it's set up depends on the type of work. For television, the most common forms are field, studio, electronic field production, and electronic news gathering. Studio production, as the name suggests, takes place in a television production studio where there is much more control over sound and lighting. These productions tend to use multiple cameras running simultaneously and the audio is obtained and processed independently through a mixing desk. The video signals are sent to the gallery where they are composed by the vision mixer and then once combined with the audio signals, it can be transmitted to our televisions at home. You're more likely dealing with talent that will address the camera directly with the assistance of a teleprompter and talking heads is one of the more common styles of composition. Examples of these always tend to be newsrooms, talk shows, quiz panel shows and most sitcoms. It's where all your green screen is going to be and there's a lot more people involved in the general workflow. With the exception of news broadcasts, many of these shows will accommodate a live studio audience, though the shows themselves can be live or pre-recorded. Field production takes place external to the conventional television studio, and may involve just a single camera with sound being recorded in camera or via a portable external recorder. With field production, you're going to be working with various natural light or perhaps in the dark, so you'd want to be using a camera with good sensitivity. The environment isn't going to be as controlled as it would be in a studio. The weather may take a turn for the worst and you may need to move to get your best shot, so all the equipment needs to be fairly mobile. Shoots of this nature could potentially spread across days or even weeks where there may not necessarily be access to an external power supply. What should come to mind are documentaries or perhaps segments of a show involving social experiments in public rather than a live show, though field production material may be included during live studio broadcasts. This type of work has been known as electronic news gathering or ENG, though the term has gradually become less common. Electronic field production, again, takes place external to the television studio and instead a dedicated venue for a specific event which accommodates the camera crews. As such, it's normal for television networks to bring a production trip to transport equipment that can enable a live broadcast feed from both handheld and hard-mounted cameras. Some common examples of VFP include music festivals, political conventions, or sports coverage. If you happen to be filming in a stadium, you may be quite far away from the action, so a useful lens to use would be one with a long focal length and a high zoom ratio. For this reason also some broadcasters are even starting to use 4K cameras so that they can zoom in digitally while maintaining a broadcast standard resolution. All the fast movement expected from sport would make it handy to use a camera capable of shooting with higher frame rates for smooth slow motion playback. These scenarios may already be suggesting what else these cameras may need to be able to do. Studio cameras are designed to work in an environment where there are also other cameras being used. Having them work together efficiently in a studio is aided by their ability to be genlocked. This is a synchronization of multiple video signals, the output, so they can record on a shared timecode and therefore refer to the same timing information. These cameras will also need an illuminated tally, which lets the camera operator and the talent on screen know which camera is live. It's one of the many ways in which the cameras are communicating with the gallery. The addition of an illuminated tally is part of the process for converting an EFP camera for use in a live multi-camera studio. So why are studio cameras so big? Anyone who has had a glimpse of the behind-the-scenes footage of a film or television show has thought about this question. It's understandable, and people will be tempted to compare them to the cameras aimed at consumers, and even the more advanced prosumer cameras, without realising the difference in technical demands. One of the crucial features of professional cameras as a whole is that many of the parameters can be adjusted independently and ergonomically, with a panel of manual controls designed for each function. For consumer and even prosumer video cameras, many of these functions, whilst being more commonly present, are often buried in menus that require navigation by means of a single directional pad on the rear of the camera, which is no good if you need to keep your eyes on what you're shooting and make adjustments on the fly. With professional cameras, the parameters accessible from the menus are more for things like playback and display settings, recording format and metadata, most of which are configured prior to or after shooting. So I've spoke about metadata, but what is it and what's the point? It's a means of logging important details from a shoot which may prove useful when someone is trying to find a certain sequence in the editing stage, or for when footage is being archived for future viewing. Some extensive projects may well have weeks of footage in need of sorting. Basic forms of metadata that people encounter most are file size and the date and time a file was created. For film and television production, a lot more information is required, and typical forms of video metadata include the make and model name of the camera, name of the camera operator at the time, the name of the show, the set name, the location, the timecode in and out, and usually there's some additional space for any other notes. It's saved to all the files on the memory card, so that wherever the footage goes, this information goes with it. 
These cameras don't just differ in terms of software, but also hardware. All the buttons, triggers and switches not only require more space on the body of the camera, but each of these designated controls feeds into a designated board, which takes up space inside the camera as well. And once all this technology is crammed inside, what's going to keep it safe from damage? A sturdy and resilient chassis that may well be subject to not only physical impact, but also strong weather conditions and high and low temperatures. All of this technology results in a relatively large power consumption, which may need to be handled by a pretty big and hefty battery, which in turn is in need of its own secure mount. Mounting it on the outside of the camera makes it quickly accessible, presumably more breathable, and allows for a bigger battery, although having it exposed like this would require for it to be fairly robust. Now things get a little bit more technical. The larger the camera, the larger the sensor can be. The larger the sensor, the more information it can receive from the lens, which in turn means the better the image quality. So how is that any different from saying, the bigger the shoes, the faster the runner? Well, a bigger sensor usually means larger pixels, and the increased surface area means a higher photon capacity, a higher signal to noise ratio, and higher dynamic range to preserve the details of the image's shadows and highlights. When it comes to sensitivity, f11 at 2000 lux seems to be the benchmark. f11 allowing for a reasonably deep focus, lux being a unit of light, and 2000 lux being the light intensity that you'd expect on a typical overcast day. Another benchmark is that of the camera's signal to noise ratio, measured in decibels, which is a way of expressing the ratio between the strength of a signal and background noise, such as in sound and the visible effect in videos takes the form of graininess which is superimposed on the image. The common conception is that anything above 50 decibels will produce a fairly usable image with some minor grain, although most professional studio and ENG cameras will have upwards of 60 decibels, which in terms of signal to noise ratio will result in a very usable picture with little to no noise. Then we've got to think about the lens. The run and gun nature of live television or coverage of live action events means camera operators don't have time to switch between different lenses during a shoot, Instead, they'll use one zoom lens that covers a wide range of focal lengths and apertures. This will result in a big, hefty lens that requires a sturdy camera body to mount onto. Naturally, it'll alter the camera's centre of mass, so the body will be designed to counterweigh this in order to maintain stability. Much like lenses for movie making applications, another important aspect of the studio camera lens is that they are par focal, meaning the lens can hold its focus on subjects when the focal length changes. This allows for a sharp image over a long focal range without the need to refocus. It also means you can refocus a shot without throwing off the focal length, commonly known as lens breathing, and this may be referred to as a constant angle focusing system, where a CPU monitors the displacement of the optics and all zoom and focus movements are internal. This technology is difficult to manufacture and requires more optical components than a simple prime lens, which in turn results in a bigger lens. Box lenses are identified by their box shape with no visible external controls. You may be wondering why they're shaped like a box when the optical elements are still round. It's because the CPU and all other technology inside exists in the form of boards which are straight and are therefore placed on the perimeter of the round optics within a box external housing. These lenses will have their own CPU that will interpret lens control functions electronically from a servo zoom demand, which looks like this. It gives you easy access to the various lens and camera functions through a multi-pin cable, each pin carrying a different signal. This CPU can make precise zoom and focus controls repeatable, which would be useful for doing multiple takes of the same sequence, and the server demand has a potentiometer to alter the speed of the zoom. Then there's ENG lenses, which bear a much similar resemblance to the 35mm cine lenses by having a zoom ring, aperture ring, and distance markings. The build quality of these ENG lenses is where compromises are made in order to have something smaller, fairly lightweight, and still perform well on the go, whilst being compatible with a servo and covering a similarly wide range of focal lengths and apertures as the box lens. Both types of lenses will use what's known as a B4 lens mount, which unlike other lens mounts, is optimised to work best with the beam splitter technology that's found in 3-chip cameras, such as 3CCD or 3CMOS, where three separate red, green and blue sensors are assembled in a prism to enhance the precision of colour reproduction. 3-chip cameras can also utilise a technology known as spatial offset processing, which is an effort to reduce aliasing and chromatic aberration, and enhance resolution by shifting the red and blue sensors a half pixel horizontally, and sometimes also vertically, with respect to the more sensitive green sensor. This would make the combined RGB pixel larger, meaning that they're more sensitive and therefore able to carry more information that helps create a better quality picture. That's another expensive manufacturing process that impacts on the cost of these types of cameras. By looking at professional lenses, you'll see a lot of this. So how can a lens be HD, and why weren't standard definition lenses good enough? After all, glass is glass, isn't it? Not exactly. When the early standard definition lenses were being designed in the first place, there were no high definition cameras to test them with. Hell, the technological standards for high definition weren't even established yet. So what are the criteria for a HD broadcast standard lens? Well, it tends to revolve around having a high MTF characteristic, a maximised contrast performance, minimal levels of distortion, minimal lens flares and internal reflection, and sufficient colour reproduction. 
MTF stands for Modulation Transfer Function. The MTF of a lens gives a good indication of the spatial frequency that it can resolve. It's tested by using black and white burst charts to see at which points the combined efforts of the lens and camera are unable to distinguish the white from the black and instead just create a grey mush. A television production camera should be able to resolve a high spatial frequency, which is measured in terms of horizontal lines of resolution. Not only that, but this high level of performance needs to be reasonably consistent across the entire image plane, as certain attributes progressively deteriorate as distance increases from the central point. To meet such standards, optical engineers rely on the accumulative surface tolerances of up to 30 optical elements falling within certain nanometric specifications. Or in plain English, everything's got to be on point. But it's no excuse to keep adding more and more glass, since each optical component becomes an additional obstacle obstructing the path of light, which in itself can lead to distortions in the image. From an economic standpoint, production companies and broadcasters will intend to buy this equipment for long-term use, and so it makes sense that they expect cameras to handle whatever conditions are thrown at them, which you could say is just the nature of the business. The cost of a reliable lens goes above and beyond the cost of a good camera. These cameras will also accommodate a larger viewfinder, which can aid in composing shots and afford more screen real estate for scopes, such as a gamma table. The gamma table acts as a useful tool for using custom gamma to fine-tune the exposure of a shot, and can be used in the gallery in order to match up shots from multiple cameras, through matching the gamma curves. Broadcasters also have a preference towards video that has been captured with little to no chroma subsampling or compression, and the final output video undergoes a colour subsampling at a ratio of 422 ready for broadcast. This basically means that in a given sample 4 pixels wide and 2 pixels high, every 2 pixels in each row have to share the same chroma information. In other words, 420 and 411 both contain too much downsampling, and if you tried to chroma key it for a green screen, the edges just wouldn't look natural. Understanding what is and is not broadcast standard in the technical sense is made easier by reading the technical delivery standards documentation that are published by broadcasters such as the BBC. For example, they outline that content delivered for HD transmission in the UK must have a spatial resolution of 1920 by 1080 pixels, full HD, thus creating an aspect ratio of 16 by 9. It also demands that final output footage have a temporal frequency of 50 fields per second in interlaced format, notated as 1080i25 or 1080i50 Hz. The rationale behind these specifications is a little bit complicated. 1920 by 1080 for 169 was agreed upon when the specs for HD television were being drawn up way back in the late 1980s by the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. The idea was put forward by a Dr. Kearns H. Powers on the grounds that the ratio was a geometric mean between the outdated standard definition ratio of 4.3 and the widescreen cinema ratio of 2.35. A refresh rate of 50 Hz was established way before, and is used to match the mains frequency of the AC power in the United Kingdom, which due to being in the PAL region, is also 50 Hz. This prevents the hum from the electric current from producing a beating distortion to the image, also known as intermodulation. In the United States, part of the NTSC region, this would be 60Hz, notated as 1080i30 or 1080i 60Hz. I stands for interlaced format, which is a method of imaging designed to conserve bandwidth, done for cost reasons. Whilst progressive imaging works by consecutively showing a single unique frame at a time, interlacing divides the picture into upper and lower fields, which alternate at a rate of 50 times a second in the PAL region, and 60 times a second in NTSC. It happens so fast that our brain's persistence of motion means that the individual fields are undetectable to the human eye, and our brains will register an after image between each field to help interpret it as a complete moving image. And that's how we watch television. The conversation of broadcast camera technology is virtually endless, though I hope that this video has offered a detailed overview of the many factors that aid broadcasters in creating the best quality material for the public.